glory to God on high. The gospel message is blandly and concisely presented in this beautiful hymn. We cannot claim that the writers of the hymns which stir our souls so deeply were inspired in the prophetic and absolute sense, for the scriptures teach the converse. There were the twelve apostles of the land, and they alone were to be so guided in their teachings that they would present to us accurately the truth and nothing but the truth. But we find that in proportion as the hearts of God's people come into tune with the Infinite One and their minds are stirred with the gospel message, God can and has used their talents for expressing in harmonious cadences His blessed truth. None can tell how much good has been accomplished through some of the beautiful hymns which have been written by faithful men and women. Properly, this hymn begins by ascribing glory to the great Heavenly Father. Properly, it declares that both the heavens and earth should be in accord in ascribing to Him honor and glory. Next comes the name of our Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He whom the Father has honored with so important a part in the great plan of salvation should be honored by all who reverence the Father and who appreciate the great work of salvation committed to the Son. As the Bible declares, all should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Not instead of the Father, nor as being the Father, but in His glorious personal character as God's only begotten, the fullest expression of the Father's glorious majesty and character. Next in order, the poet calls our attention to the grand outcome of the plan of salvation. Soon shall all sorrow cease, for lo, the Prince of Peace cometh to reign. There could be no proper presentation of the gospel which ignores the millennial reign of Christ. As Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as in heaven, so also he taught them to wait for the kingdom as God's agency for bringing about the wonderful change in human affairs. Jesus invited us to become his disciples, to follow him, that we might share in the kingdom, that we might be the royal family, to reign with him for the blessing of the world, for the uplifting of the fallen race back to human perfection. Oh yes, that reign of a thousand years of Messiah and his church, the bride, is the very essence of the gospel of God's love, of the divine arrangement for the world's salvation. Goodbye, God be with you. You realize that the expression goodbye really means God be with you. The expression comes down to us from the simpler customs of the past, still largely preserved in Palestine. There, the common salutation as the people pass each other is still, much after the manner of Bible times. For instance, one will say, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. And the other will reply, The Lord cause his face to shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee. True Christians might learn a lesson from this. Our Christian welfare should be the topic, rather than merely our temporal welfare. Thus would our hearts be lifted from the present vexatious and burdens and fares of life, and pointed to the glorious things which are ours by faith. When we as Christians sing, God be with you till we meet again, we are recognizing that our times are in God's hands, that we are His children, that He has given us exceeding great and precious promises, and has assured us that all things will work together for our good, because we love Him and have been called according to His purpose. Reflection upon these things and interchange amongst the brethren respecting them will assist us greatly in making our calling and election sure. Everything which helps to draw us nearer the heavenly Lord draws us closer to all who are His, increasing the bonds of Christian fellowship, making all God's people stronger in their conflict with sin and Satan and merciful in their dealings with the weaknesses of others. This beautiful hymn seems especially appropriate when we are about to part from the brethren and realize that we know not what awaits us or whether we shall ever see each other again. The hymn comes as a benediction to the soul, committing those who go and those who stay to divine care and supervision. 
Let us continue to sing it with the spirit and with the understanding. Let us permit the same principle to enter into the daily affairs of life. Let us remember that not merely the great changes in life are under divine supervision, but also, as the Master has expressed it, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. This signifies the extreme interest of the Heavenly Father in all who become sons of God. To have this constantly before our minds is a source of strength and of courage. Alas, how many Christians neglect their privileges and meet the difficulties of life single-handed, fighting their own battles, directing their own ways, not submitting themselves fully and heartily to the divine will, not watching the leadings of divine providence. Thousands of hearts and voices. According to the Bible, all the heavenly hosts are intensely interested in the great drama of sin and salvation which is being enacted in our little world. This is the only rebellious province in the entire realm of creation. Angels wondered at Satan's rebellion and that he was not at once destroyed. They wondered further when Satan tempted Father Adam and they saw him become a sinner. They have wondered since that the reign of sin and death as it has progressed for over 6,000 years. No intelligent being in heart sympathy with God could feel disinterested in respect to so gigantic a rebellion or fail to wonder how the matter would be treated by the Almighty. St. Peter tells us that the angels sought to look into the meaning of the Old Testament prophecies which foretold the coming of Messiah and his work of rescuing the world from the curse. We may be sure that they stood all astonished with wonder as they beheld the outworking of the divine plan. First, God's proposition to the Logos, that if he would become the savior of men, he would have the divine blessing and an exaltation to a position next to Jehovah. Second, the Logos divesting himself of his glory, becoming a man. Third, the death of Jesus to redeem mankind. Surely it seems strange to them that the Heavenly Father would permit his loyal son to be thus demeaned. They wondered expectantly until the resurrection morning when they beheld that he who had humbled himself had been exalted again by the Father's power, not only to the spirit plane where he was before, but to the highest plane, the divine nature. What a rapture shout of exaltation, doubtless ascended in the heavenly court as Jesus arose from the dead, a glorious, life-giving spirit. A little later, by the divine decree, the angelic host acclaimed him Lord of all and bowed to him as the Father's representative. Ever since, they've been watching the further development of God's plan in the finding of the saintly Jews from every nation and denomination worthy to be his true church. These are called to make a similar covenant, to walk in their master's footsteps, to suffer with him that they may reign with him as his bride and joint heir in his glorious kingdom. It is at this point that this beautiful hymn takes up the thread and notes the angelic shout when Messiah's kingdom begins its reign for the blessing of all the families of the earth. Next to the crucifixion of our Lord as the basis of all reconciliation for sinners, the kingdom of Messiah is common in the Bible. By it the blessing God purposes shall be offered to every member of Adam's race. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. At the very crown of our head, phrenologists locate the quality or veneration or reverence. It is found in every human being. It is God's voice or message in human nature calling us to the exercise of our very highest privilege, worship. Naturally, every man and woman prays to God and desires to worship. We see this in the heathen. We recognize it in ourselves. St. Paul represents the heathen as blinded by ignorance and as feeling after God if happily they might find him find that which would be the most habitifying thing that they could possibly come to them, the thing which their souls continually crave. 
but unintentionally we have driven the heathen away from God as we have driven ourselves away from him by false doctrines which have misrepresented the divine person, character, and plan. Nobody wants a demon for a God. Nobody loves demons. While we have declared in Bible language that God is love, that he is the Father of mercy, from whom cometh down every good and every perfect gift, nevertheless, our creeds have discounted this. For how could we believe that a loving God, the Father of mercy, would prearrange or foreordain with full knowledge and power for the eternal torture of thousands of millions of our race? It is time for us to come to appreciate this beautiful hymn and to sing from the heart, Holy, 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 Lord, God Almighty. It is time, too, for us to recognize the divine holiness must absolutely contradict this blasphemous theory of our creed, which in Paul's style, doctrines of devils, and which came to us from way back in the dark ages. The farther we get away from those priests, the more beauty of divine holiness we will discern, and the more of it we will be able to copy in our own hearts and lives, and the more we will be able to teach it to others, and to show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. It will be noticed that the words of this beautiful hymn are slightly altered from the Church of England music which sings of one God in three persons. This delusion Emperor Constantine forced upon the church through the Nicene Council in A.D. 325. Since then, those who accepted his Trinitarian theory have shed much innocent blood in their endeavor to establish it. But Bible students are finding that neither the word Trinity nor any thought respecting Trinity is to be found in the Bible. What a relief this is from the confusion of the statement that three persons are one person, or reversely, that one person is three persons. The Bible alone is reasonable, sensible, beautiful. How can we keep from singing? This glorious hymn most wonderfully pictures the joy of the Christian faith. The experience of the Christian should not be an evanescent one. Outwardly, he may have the same sorrows as others, but inwardly, he has the peace of God which has of all understanding, ruling in his heart. It is like living in a new world, where in the clamor of the present times, he is indeed heard, but not so much heeded, because he hears the ringing of the music of the new dispensation. The Christian's heart is with his Lord. His expectations are not for earthly wealth or fame, but for kingdom glory, honors, privileges, and services. Even now, he rejoices in his wonderful opportunities for service. He is an ambassador for Christ, a representative of the coming kingdom, a finger post, a director for those who are feeling after God and wishing to be in harmony with him. As years go by, the Christians' experiences, if they are proper ones, grow richer and richer. Earthly joys and comforts may be taken away to prove his faithfulness and loyalty to God. But the fact that he is still in relationship to the Father and the Son is a source of continuous pleasure. It offsets all his losses. His faith grows stronger under trial. His inmost calm is the more serene. He looks forward trustingly, realizing his master to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. He feels like singing, yea, often like shouting, both filled with beings of the Spirit, a sense of the divine presence. The apostle admonishes, set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth, and this thought is image near the close of his hymn. As we lift our eyes more and more to the heavenly things, the intervening clouds become less and less, and the realities of the future life deepen their impression upon us. The pathway so rugged and narrow gradually smooth as the child of God gets a firmer hold upon his old nature and brings in the subjection to the new mind. 
we learn to love the narrow way, not merely because of the glorious outcome at its further end, when he will be received into his father's house on high, but also because of present privileges of service in this way. The storms of life, its sorrows, its tears, do not penetrate so deeply as once they did. They are counted as light afflictions. All things are mine since I am his, the Christian joyfully sing. The development of the Church of Christ is the great work of God for the present age. All the powers of heaven are enlisted. Soon, however, the great work of blessing the world will begin, for the millennial age is already dawning. The Christian firm foundation. Christians have often been laughed at as credulous because by God's arrangement, they must now walk by faith, not by sight. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath in reservation for them that love him. Yet nearly all thinking people have certain notions as to the future, nearly all expecting a future life. Some speculate that the dying are really more alive than they were before they died. Others speculate along evolutionary lines and tell us that their hope for the future is not for themselves, but for their posterity, who may reach such a state of development as will permit them to live forever. All these speculators must admit that they have nothing more for their belief than mere conjecture, no revelation from God, no proof. The Christian's position is a much better and more reasonable one. He trusts not to his own speculations, nor to the speculations of others, realizing that these are of little value. He accepts the Bible as the word of God. He is there informed that God has provided for the recovery of the entire race from the sentence of death, and that eventually all the willing and obedient may yet attain everlasting life through the merit of Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. The Bible does not set before the mind of the Christian the absurdity that the dead are more alive than before they died. The Bible declares that the dead are dead or figures that they asleep and would have no further knowledge or interest in anything under the sun except through the divine arrangement, the resurrection of the dead. As by a man, Adam came death. By a man, Jesus, also comes the resurrection of the dead, says St. Paul. The Bible tells us when this resurrection will take place, namely at the second coming of Jesus, when he shall establish his glorious millennial kingdom, promised through Moses and all the prophets, and through Christ and the apostles. Does not the Christian have a firm foundation? He not only has God's word for his faith, but he has a reasonable faith, confirmed by everything known on the subject. He knew he know that we all die, and that the dead apparently know nothing. We know that they could suffer neither joy nor sorrow while asleep in death. The only hope for any then is through a resurrection. And this is exactly what the Bible tells. The believer has strong consolation, strong confirmation, strong reasons for believing that God's message and for disregarding not only his own imagination, but the untrustworthy imaginations of others also. On hence now, satisfied this. The psalmist wrote, I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. This is understood as a prophecy of the glorious resurrection of Jesus and his faithful followers, the gospel church. These all, fully committed to the will of God, are content, whatever lot they see. Their contentment is based upon God's assurance that he will supervise all their interests and make all things work together for their highest good. They can trustingly accept their trials, disappointments, heartaches, and headaches, and every other unfavorable condition as being subject to God's overruling providence, and as contributing, therefore, to their growth in the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But our contentment with things, not satisfying, not joyous, but grievous, does not imply satisfaction with these things. We are really very dissatisfied, although content to have them now because they are part of the cup 
which our Father has borne for Jesus and his followers. Our satisfaction, as God's prophet has declared, is to come in our glorious resurrection when we shall awake in the likeness of Jesus and of the Father, partakers of the divine nature. Throughout the Bible, the resurrection of the church is pointed to as the goal of her ambition. The Apostle Paul describes her resurrection scene in graphic terms. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in animal body. It is raised a spiritual body. And he declares, we all must be changed because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus also describes this blessed resurrection of the church, which he had already experienced, saying, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the chief resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Messiah, and shall reign with him a thousand years. St. Paul styles the resurrection of the church a part of Christ's resurrection, saying, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, being conformed unto his death. This beautiful hymn has entered deeply into the spiritual life of many of the Lord's saintly people. It tells of their trials and tests their hopes and joys and their final victory. It tells of the necessity for pain, difficulties and disappointments now, that their affections may be the more separated from earthly things and set permanently upon the things above. And one who lives the sentiment of this hymn will surely be a burning and a shining light in this life and in the future a part of the glorious sun of righteousness which is to illuminate the whole world. Coming to Jesus, into nearly every human heart at some time, there comes such an experience as this beautiful hymn suggests. A feeling of loneliness, of desolation, of the need of an unchangeable friend. Instinctively, then, there is a reaching out of the mind for Jesus, if the individual has ever heard of him. But alas, with many, there is little knowledge of what is meant by coming to Jesus or becoming his disciples. Often before the important point is reached and the great transaction consummated, the stress passes and the individual falls back again into his old course of thinking and doing. Coming to Jesus signifies the acceptance of him as the great and powerful Savior whom the Heavenly Father has appointed and sent forth as his own representative to recover us out of our fallen, sinful, dying condition. Coming to Jesus, we first ascertain on what terms he will receive us and become our advocate and induct us into the Heavenly Father's family. We hear his word, if any man wills to be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The first step of self-denial means the renouncement of our human will as in conflict with the divine will. We dare not give up our will to any but the law. The will is the most precious thing we possess. It would not be safe to entrust it to our best earthly friends, not even the parents, the husband, nor the wife. But we dare give our will to God because we have learned of his great love and sympathy and wisdom, of his divine arrangement for the blessing of all who make a surrender to him. But the surrender of our will is merely the first step Next comes the daily life, taking up the cross, doing the Lord's will in opposition to our own will and the wills of our friends and the various opposing influences. To be a Christian is to be a follower of the Lamb. As Jesus gave up his will to do the Father's will, so do all his followers. Thus coming to Jesus and accepting his will and the Father's will, we receive the begetting of the Holy Spirit and thenceforth are children of God, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ our Lord, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. From that time on we begin to hear the Lord's voice speaking to us through the Bible, and a great light comes into our lives. Everything begins to look different from our new standpoint. Earthly successes, earthly trials, earthly joys, and earthly sorrows 
are all insignificant in comparison to the heavenly blessings, heavenly aspirations, heavenly hopes. After that we were illuminated, we endured in a great fight of affliction. God kindly saved my mind. Those who become Christians in the Bible sense and fully surrender their lives and all their interests in the present life agree to leave all these in the hands of the Lord for him to guide and shape according to his wisdom. Since our human will is the most valuable thing we possess, to give it to another might be termed slavery because the will carries with it time, talent, influence, money, everything. Thus the apostles styled himself a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. God only could be trusted with this most valuable possession. But it is wise and reasonable that we should trust it with God. He is our creator, deeply interested in us, and both able and willing to order our lives and shape our affairs for the best possible results. Having made the consecration of the will to God, it is the Christian's reasonable service to live it out day by day. This devotion to the Lord is described in the first stanza of this precious hymn. The Christian secret of a happy life consists in his full submission of will to the will of God and his full trust in God's wisdom, justice, love, and power. The true Christian thus takes out an insurance policy, the like of which is not obtainable from any other source. He ensures that God, giving his little all, he receives God's assurance of divine care and supervision of for his overruling providence and of the glorious outcome, whether in sickness or in health, in poverty, vain or abounding in wealth. Oh, happy the true sons of God. Suggestions to doubt the wisdom, the love, or the power of our God must come from the adversary, either directly or through our fallen nature, prone to doubt and fear. The adversary in all his suggestions are contrary to God's word and are to be resisted with our wills, our minds, resolutely. Hence it is not sufficient that the Christian have a general knowledge of the scriptures. It is important that he search the scriptures daily, that he continually come into contact with the divine messages and assurances if he would continue strong in the Lord and would grow in grace and in love. Otherwise he will be in danger of becoming heavy of wishing to manage his own affairs, not submitting his interest to the will of God, nor watching for the Lord's leading. The Christian who walks close to the Lord will seek to note the leadings of his providence in even the smallest affairs and experiences, knowing that there are important lessons to be learned in the school of Christ and trusting in the divine promise that all things shall work together for his good. I love to tell the story of gracious heavenly love. All kinds in books were freely sprinkled with him, telling of the wrath of God against sinners and of the eternal sufferings of the unholy for non-elect. Saintly Dr. Watson wrote of hell, where the breath of God, his angry breath, supplies and fans the fire. Again, of how the hellish dark will be heard by demons in one eternal storm. And our godly forefathers sang of those torches. Thank God, sanity on religious matters is triumphant. Now our hymn books are filled with messages respecting God's love. Surely the apostle was right when he wrote, The love of Christ constraineth us, and perfect love passeth out fear. Satan has used the lash of fear to drive away from God those who by nature would have been inclined to feel after him. Nobody is drawn to a demon. Nobody is interested in a book telling about a demon and his plan. By thus misrepresenting the Almighty Creator, from whom comes every good and every perfect gift, Satan has driven mankind away from God and the Bible, his message of love and mercy. St. Paul prophesied concerning that long period of darkness in which these evil doctrines respecting God's character were concocted and put into the creeds and him. He declared prophetically, The many shall depart from thee faith, giving thee to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. This prophecy was fulfilled during the Dark Ages from the 4th century to the 16th. From 325 A.D., when the first creed was made, 
down to Reformation time of the 16th century, gladly were then emerging from the darkness and from the stupefying influence of the errors which the Bible style drunk with false doctrine. Today, the majority of intelligent people realize that something is wrong, but they know not what. Comparatively, few have learned that the trouble is entirely with the creeds of the Dark Ages and not with the Bible. Christians have known and have sung about the love of God for centuries, but it is impossible to reconcile what the creeds told us respecting the evil designs of our Creator against our race as a whole with any conceivable view of his true justice and true love. With one heart we have turned away from those marketing creeds of the past. But not many have yet found the beauties of the Bible and the message it bears and rightly understood as told in this reading. To such the gospel is indeed a satisfactory portion. And is it any wonder that those who have heard the love message will like to tell it off to others? How could a loyal child of God hold back the old, old story. The way you would see it is dead, not falling, and the final annihilation of the incorrigible in the second death will cut a part of the gospel.